Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are how the devil are you doing, Ken? <laughs> I'm exceptionally well. Thanks for asking, <laughs> Rory. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, this is a brand new season of the Counseling Tutor Podcast. We're just coming out of an academic break. Uh, I'm so excited because we've got a new format uh, for those of you that watch the podcast on YouTube. And if you're not watching it on YouTube, go to YouTube and put in Counseling Tutor Podcast. You'll find us there. You'll see there's a slightly different look specifically on my side. I've changed studio, being posh Rory, I've just moved house. <laughs> Studio. the new format so we're starting off with a brand new section theory in practice and this is where we're going to be uh, taking common theories uh, held in counseling and psychotherapy but looking not so deep at the theory but how does that theory really apply in the real world practice theory in itself reading it from a textbook can sometimes be dry but when you put it into practice oh it's when the real magic happens rory <laughs> i'm looking forward to that section yes uh, practice partner is a brand new section to the to the podcast that's our section second section today within uh, practice partner we're going to be looking at um, private practice what you need to consider if you're setting up to uh, earn a living or to earn some of your living as a counselor or psychotherapist and today we're going to be looking at the all-important business mindset very different to a counselor or a psychotherapist mindset a business mindset uh, interesting conversation and and then we go into practice matters we're keeping practice matters because boy does it work and that's where we call on professionals out there that are in practice to come and share uh, some cpd with us or an element of their practice and today we have christine shaw who's going to be speaking about humor in therapy well rory let's get into that uh, very first section that we've been talking about that's theory in practice and we're talking about how to use the core conditions Yes, and I think we'll start off by just looking at the, the words empathy, congruence, and unconditional positive regard. And, of course, they're words out of a textbook, Ken. They're words out of a textbook. Reading them and, and understanding what they mean, you know, to write an essay, is, I think, a little different to actually practising them. And I think if we start off with congruence being real – and I think that I, like a lot of people, came from a, a different profession when I studied counselling. And if I'm honest, being real and genuine and being me wasn't something that was part of that profession. I was part of a company that, that had a message. And it, it took a little while for me just to be myself because clients meet you in the therapy room mm -hmm. or if you're doing your skills practice. If you're real and and genuine and and a, a, a real person in front of them, they're more likely to share what's on their their troubled minds. And empathy, I think, is about really working hard to put your stuff to one side. It's not about you; it's about them listening to their frame of reference. And I think you know, I, I was I was I was out recently having lunch, and I was listening to two people having a conversation. And one person wasn't displaying empathy. Every time the person said, I'm having this difficulty, I could hear the other person said, oh, you think that's difficult? You should hear my difficulty. Yeah. And eventually that person just didn't explore it anymore. They went on to talk about uh, something on the TV. And I think that's the key thing. We have to put our own experience, valid as it is, to one side. And we're focused on that person in front of us. They are everything whether you're doing it in practice or you're doing it in skills and you know if you're starting as a, a student maybe you're going going back to do your skills session or you're just starting them it can take a bit of practice you know just to sit and listen and try and reflect back what somebody said to try and understand their frame of reference and then finally and i think this is probably the toughest unconditional positive regard you know, Ken, we have our own value systems, things that we believe we should do in our lives and our family does. And we're going to meet people who have different values and different ideas. Yeah. And again, we have to give them unconditional positive regard. They may have a very different view of life. I mean, uh, a good example might be in the UK a few years ago, we had, if I dare mention this, Brexit, and that was very polarising. So if you think you may sit on one or either side of the fence of Brexit, we should have stayed, we should have we, we should have gone, you know. 
But, you know, if you meet someone with a different view to you, how do you give them empathy? And, and you do uh, um, unconditional positive regard, and you do that by by pausing your own value system and and hearing their value system. And I have to say, congruence, empathy, and unconditional positive regard, they're personal development points, and you have to work on them. You know, nobody, and I include myself, wandered in to a therapy room or a skills practice room, and they were all there. It just didn't happen. And more to the point, Ken, it's ongoing. This is ongoing piece of work. When I meet people now, in, in you know, in therapy, um, I'm working on it. It's a complete work in progress. And I've been working on it for the last 20 years, Ken. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? There's no end to that personal development. No. Um, I love that you've uh, chosen this as a topic for that brand new theory in, in, in practice section, Rory. And I like that you started with congruence. You know, we understand what congruence is. Look it up in a textbook. There it is. It's outlined for you. It's kind of being your true genuine is another word used for congruence, isn't it? Genuine self. It's mm. kind of when what you're feeling inside is, mm. is shown outside. And I can't help but think back to my first steps when I went into placement. I had an idea of who counselling Ken was. So I kind of, I think I was still finding out who Ken was at that st stage. I mean, it was it was uh, early placement. Um and I almost felt that I needed to be a professional counsellor, that I needed to show up, sit a little bit straighter, speak in a, in a calmer and more informed uh, way. And, and of course, realising that congruence is about being who you are, you know, and, and the reason I'm bringing this is because I've heard it from so many students, you know, sometimes we're tempted to maybe look at somebody else and maybe look at Carl Rogers or one of the skills practice sessions that available online and go, oh, I don't do it like that. I don't show up like that. Maybe I need to try and be like that. And all we need to do is be our true selves. What we're doing with that congruence is showing the client that I'm going to be me. You know, I'm going to be as individual as, as, as I am a human. And it's okay for you to be you. There's the message that comes across in that. Uh, of course, empathy. I love empathy. Mm. Uh, uh, empathy, I think, is, again, it's interesting because we're, we're, we're kind of walking in their shoes, seeing it from a client's frame of reference. So when I first thought about empathy, I thought it was about looking out, looking out from the client's eyes, as it were. But you're right, Rory, it's about your personal development. The more you develop yourself, the more empathic you can be uh, in service of others. And that's that's interesting. And that is almost a, a paradoxical that we need to yeah. work on ourselves to be there to be able to to serve others. You know, you think, no, I've got to work more on serving others. But, you know, the more we clear our own Jahari's window, great personal development tool, look it up online. We've got podcasts about it. Go to counselingtutor.com, type it in the search. Um, uh, clearing that window out, the, the more we know about ourselves, who we are, how we show up, you know, if you're talking about that first word congruence, we get to, to, to found that, find our authentic self, and then be there in service of someone else, because it's our stuff that gets in the way. If somebody is sharing something, we go, oh, that's almost like this, like that person, or like that happened to me, then we're not being there. We're not fully empathic. So recognizing our own stuff to be able to put that one side doesn't mean we're perfect. doesn't mean we've worked through everything and that we're now, uh, I, I guess, glowing and floating as we walk around. You know, we're all people. And that's, that's congruence right there. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the unconditional positive regard. And UPR, as it's known. And I want to share something from Carl Rogers. I pulled it up. Um, it's a caring which is not possessive, which demands no personal gratification. It involves an acceptance of and a caring for the client as a separate person with permission for him or her to have his or her own feelings and experiences and to find his or her own meaning for them. Mr. Carl Rogers. I love that. Wonderful quote, that is. I love that. Mm -hmm. I really do. You know, that unconditional positive regard. We've spoken about it before on the podcast. It's not about agreeing with everybody's lifestyle or what they may have done or the positions that they hold, but it is recognizing they have a right 
to feel and think that way, you know, and looking at them as a fellow human being. So we're not looking for the difference. We're looking for what is the same. When I'm in a room and there's a client sat opposite me, there's another beating heart. Even if that's online, there's another beating heart. And it's about that deep compassion and care that that other beating heart has as much right as anybody to be free of their pain. And I think that kind of, for me, is that that unconditional positive regard in action and all of them, you know, read them in a textbook, write about them in your assignments, but to practice them, it is about practice. It's about getting out there and it's about uh, your own personal develop, growing as a person. And as you grow, so those, I guess we called them core conditions when we started this off, grow within our practice in service of others, Rory. Yes, and I, I think I'd like to pick up that, grow grow within the practice. I think that's important because um, I can't tell you how many can I have a word with you conversations I've had with students through the years. At the end of a class, someone hangs back. And and the, 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 and one of the questions that comes up a lot is, so do you, do you practice the core conditions in your life, just in the therapy room or in your general life? And my answer to that was I do the best I can. Mm. I do the best I can. And I, I I think of it like the control knobs on an old hi-fi amplifier. You used to have balance and tone and bass that you could turn them up and down. And and I I have those controls for empathy, you know, empathy, congruence, unconditional positive regard in my outside life. So I I I try I try my best, but there are some times where you know you have to you have to stand your ground and you know recently i was in a queue to get a coffee and somebody pushed in front of me and i said oh hang on a second you know and uh they, they, they kind of muttered and went onto the onto the back so you know you i i think i think for me it's it's about a realization in my outside life that everybody has their own story ken everybody has their own story and sometimes we don't see that story we just see the behavior so i try to i try to think of it like like that i try to you know if someone's a bit rude to me i think they're maybe having a bad day and you know i try and i've got to be honest most days I fail, um, you know, I, to, to be totally congruent, genuine, unconditional, positive regard within my own life, because it's, it's a very tough ask. And life sometimes doesn't allow you to do that just to, to be in your own life. So the answer to the question is, do, do you practice it in your own life? I think it, you adapt it, you work, you work at that. And it's about your own personal development my wife will my wife will sometimes say to me she'll say you're so philosophical about things rory it just doesn't anything kind of get on your nerves and i said well you know everybody's got their own story but sometimes you just have to you know you have to step in and say you know that's not okay um but yeah it, it, it it's i think it's one of those things that anybody who's studying counseling learns to adapt into their own life but in the therapy room of course, we can turn those volume knobs up to the full capacity and just focus on the person in front of us. I'm, I'm glad you went down that road, Rory. I, I think, well, I know from from messages, emails, and and uh, posts on Facebook or messages on Facebook we get. You know, there's often that 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 student starting this road that thinks that you need to practice this 100% all of the time, always be empathic, always view everybody, no matter where in your life with unconditional positive regard. And as you say, you know, they, they, they become a way of being, they do. Mm -hmm. Carl Rogers speaks about that and that's fantastic. And as we develop, it's almost like they become more natural, naturally implemented within, within your life. You know, I can think of times that I might be standing in a supermarket and, and somebody might be in a bad mood and, and say something and push in front of me or whatever it may be. And everything remains calm inside and there's a little smile on my face and, and it is a smiling of caring and loving for that person for where they may be. But there's also days when that same thing might happen. <laughs> when, like a day I had. <laughs> yeah, you, you like a day you were just, really, you know, and, and that is that is real life. And I think congruence is about saying that that's yeah. how it is. You know, yeah. it's not a bar that we have to reach. It is something that we look at to implement within our lives. Of course, when we're in the counseling session, we, we, we act from that way of being because we know 
And the the research and the theory shows us that it is effective. Mm. It is effective. And the more you practice it, the more it becomes part of your life. I wanted to share another Carl Rogers quote. Um, the more I can keep a relationship free of judgment and evaluation, the more this will permit the other person to reach the point where he or she recognizes that the locus of evaluation, the center of responsi responsibility lies within himself, herself. I'm putting in the, uh, the gender specifics there, uh, but it, it, it's, it's interesting because it, it, that, that's the theory, you know, there, there is the theory, but in practice, we practice that. Why? Because the theory shows us that that is effective. And also when you do adapt that, uh, the, the core conditions as a, as a way of being, I think they soften life, Rory. I think I feel my life is richer for that learning and that integration of those conditions within my everyday life. Oh, I, I, I quite agree. And, you know, you've quoted, beautifully from uh, from rogers can in in this piece and I, I i would like to just remind everybody of course of carl rogers potato in the potato bin at uh, Glen allen where of course he he lived on the farm and um he went down and looked at the potato bin and saw this potato sprouting and it was doing its best um in, in even though it was in uh, kind of reduced circumstances with little light and no water and no soil it was just little, doing a little sprout and he's he you know he plants a potato in the ground with water and light and nutrient and it will it will sprout out and and i think you know that that's where those core conditions are rogers referred to it as soil of a different kind mm. and i th i think that's that's where that's where the theory really lives. We're we're kind of emotional gardeners in our practice, and and we we tend to our clients and even even our, our, our you know our, our peers when we're doing skills, in the same way we we would tend to someone help it help it grow, and if that means sometimes we get dirty hands and we get a few aches and pains along the way, that's that's what you buy into. Gardening is hard work and therapy can sometimes be a bit taxing. So I, I think the message is, you know, we don't have to be perfect, but we just have to try and we have to reflect. And part of it is sitting and thinking, well, you know what, how could I have done that differently? I don't use the word better, differently. What was in me that held me back from being more congruent? Or, you know, what was it in me that stopped me fully accepting the person in front of me? And ask yourself those, those questions. Really? You know, I think that's where the work is, Ken. Yeah, in that personal development. Great topic. Thanks for bringing it, Rory. There it is. Theory in Practice, our brand new section. Lots more to come. So keep on uh, tuning into the Counseling Tutor podcast. And we now go into the second of our, our new sections. And this is Practice Partner, where we recognize that uh, being a practitioner uh, sometimes requires that we go into running a business in, in some way, shape or form, whether that is part time or whether that is a full time income. Um, and this is maybe not something that's taught when we do our core training. And I, I look back to my core training. And I, luckily, I had you as my tutor, Rory. And there was actually a, sec, a, 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 a was. session that we did on starting a private practice. But um, it, it's kind of very shallow, not what you taught, Rory, but in terms of, of core training, because the time is spent quite rightly on becoming a professional practitioner. So practice partner, we're going to focus on that uh, during this season. And today, Rory, you've chosen to bring business mindset. I think this is the crux. This is this. I think without this being in place, the rest is very difficult to get right. And and I think we're going to, I think we'd like to start, Ken, with looking at what the term business is. Yeah. Business is not a huge car, a large cigar, a pinstripe suit <laughs> and and sitting behind a huge oak table in a leather chair. Business is providing a quality service to the people that you serve. Yeah. It's about making sure that you can pay your bills. And it's about making sure that in, 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 in these times you can buy food, pay your bills and, and look after you and your family. That is, that is business. And I think, I might be speaking out of turn here, but I think some therapists think of business in the latter rather than the former. They think of it more as the cigar and the pinstripe suit and the Rolls Royce rather than 
offering a service which someone will pay you. And I, th- I think that it's, it's, it is absolutely principled to offer a paid service. Yeah. Uh, mental health provision in this country, as we know, certainly in, talking about the UK, is, I, I would say, patchy. And people are happy to pay, you know, private dentistry, um, you know, private chiropody. You know, these are all people who offer a private service. And I don't think counselling should be any different. And I acknowledge that that might be a hard transition for someone who thinks that it should be free. The hard fact of the world is it's not. Uh, the provision isn't as uh, widespread as it should be, and people will will pay. So I think understanding the principles of business, that you're there to serve your customer, you're there to pay any bills that your business generates, and that you then take from that money to feed your family, is a, is a pretty good start, Ken. What do you think? Yeah, it's <clears throat> th- th- this topic of kind of valuing your skills and and putting a pound or a dollar about depending on where you are in the world. Yeah. I'm going to go through all the world's currencies now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a, a, a value, a monetary value on your skills. It can be tricky because <sighs> most of the time, going into counselling, we're, we're kind of drawn into it because we want to make a difference. We want to help. We want to serve. We want to be there for others. Um, we don't go into it to accumulate riches and buy the pinterest suit as you were just talking about <laughs> Rory and the cigars. Yeah. Uh, and there's, I think that that mindset of wrestling with that, can I charge for this? If I'm charging for this, what about the person who can't afford it? Um, uh, at, and am I exploiting people in, in some way? And the truth of the matter um, is that if, if you're practicing as, as a counsellor, even if you are practicing in a charity and the sessions are being delivered free at point of contact, money is changing hands. It mm. just is. It will, the likely that that charity will be funded because you need to open your cupboards at home and see tins of beans and sugar and flour. And we, we need to feed ourselves and look after our family, as you quite rightly said, mm. Rory. And I think that it's the realization that taking money is not exploiting there are different there are different people who choose different routes and there are people um, that of course struggle financially mm. and there are services and funded services in place but on the other side there are those that choose to pay mm. and they do choose to pay and a, and a, a gp surgery where i did my placement um quite often the 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 client would be um uh, suggested that the that they that counseling was offered within the practice but it was it was um a quite a long waiting list and people would say can i pay you know people can choose to pay so there is no exploitation there and i think we if you're going to be running a business if you're going to be running a private practice you're going to be charging money for that we need to wrestle with that get over that first and you're 100 percent right rory when you could when you're kind of defining what a business is you know when we look to wall street when we look to uh the the capitalist system there's a very ugly side to business there just is there is an incredible exploitation of the workers of the uh you know it's all about profit margins but it doesn't have to be that 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 is not the definition of business business means you're ex you you, you're kind of exchanging a service for money Mm. um and I, th- I think there's a great starting point to wrestle with that, to to value yourself and go, you know what, I can charge for this. You know what, you work hard. You work hard to get your training. And when you go to get your training, they don't go, well, you're going to be doing good at the end of this training, so you don't have to pay for your training. They go, that will be so many thousands of pounds, please, for your training. You're paying for it. And I think that that is a great start in mindset, Rory. Absolutely, Ken. And have a think about all the people you deal with on a daily basis. You know, it, it may be a local cafe owner or, uh, I don't know, the, the the person who runs the the, the antique shop that you go in or, or, or the charity charity shop you go in. They're all running a business. And, you know, there's there's a near me, there's a, a young woman who's owned a hatch in a wall, which I think is brilliant. It's called the hatch Love it. and sells coffee and biscuits. And she was unemployed, and she's not got. She's got herself a nice little business, um, exchanging money for coffee, cakes, homemade bread, 
the quality is a lot better than you would get at, uh, you know, maybe a chain, which is why she has a lot of customers. And she really looks after her customers. And I think that's the crux of it. You know, as a self-employed person or someone in, in a business, you can offer the service you want to to your to your customers and to those who may say well you know you know private practice you know it costs money and everybody who goes private is reducing the waiting list yeah. of the list of people who can't afford it mm -hmm. and we don't and we don't live in an ideal world you know I'd, I'd, i you know i'd love that we lived in this world where everybody could get everything they wanted and you could argue that you know governments of any persuasion could do more but the fact of the matter is we are where we are and you know if you feel you can do that and and provide for your family there's nothing wrong with that at all and i will share to you i i, I was i was only i was been only been in private practice for about six years i spent the last 14 uh doing pro bono work yeah. and i have to say when i started private practice it it felt really i said to my supervisor someone gave me some money <laughs> and my supervisor said yes that's because you offered a service <laughs> and and it took a little bit of getting used to but it, i want to say it's okay you know and you can choose you know if you decide to offer a lower cost for someone who's struggling it's your business you can do that so you still have you can still be compassionate but you should you should if if you've got a skill you should be paid for it. And if you don't believe that, phone up the local decorator and ask them to paint your house for free. See how far you get. <laughs> yeah. Or any other service. Really. Or any other service, yes. Yeah. And and I think, you know, you touched on something there, Rory, about the the, the years of, of uh, pro bono work that you did and then mm. that feeling that came over you when it was now time to ask for money or receive mm. money. And I think that's important because there's an area of personal development there and I guess the question is what is your relationship with money if you look back in your life how is how is that relationship and sometimes when we're considering that business mindset we need to we need to confront our relationship with money you know mm. um you know you, you you may have sayings that go oh I'm not very good with money well what does that mean where did that come from who gave you that is that real or is that an irrational belief that you're holding on to there and you can take this to your supervisor there's no reason why you can't take the feelings that you have uh, around uh, uh, your private practice relationship with the business uh, mindset to your supervisor i certainly did with mine uh, and i was of course paying my supervisor yeah. when i was <laughs> going there so there was a business transaction taking place yeah. And it's interesting, um, like yourself, Rory, uh, when, when I was paying for those services, when I was paying for my personal therapy during my, my training, and I was struggling, I was holding down multiple jobs and yeah. uh, balancing the life, as we all know, it's, it's, it's tricky times then. When I was paying, and I was paying a, a slightly reduced rate with my counselor, which I'm really grateful for, I never at any stage thought, oh, I'm being taken for a ride here, this is exploitation. And when I was playing my supervisor, I wasn't thinking that. But when I was taking my first money, I had feelings of, oh, ah, ee. So the feelings only existed within me. And, you know, you touched on something a little earlier, Rory, and that if you are charging for what you do in a business, now, obviously, you would need to be set up as a business to be doing this. Um, there is a potential that you might be able to help more people. You know, we're told that when it comes to... Um, self-care that we need to look after ourselves first in order to be there for our clients and the same is true in business and i look back to the the, the roots of counseling tutor R rory and i started counseling tutor because we wanted to help it, and everything we put out was free for well over two years it was, yeah. and during that time uh we helped i'm gonna say hundreds of people mm. in that time and we were able to serve those people and it and and we're glad we did that and you know when we went over to um paid services i mean we still have many many free services mm. counselingtutor.com is free this podcast is free our youtube channel uh with uh, millions of views is 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 free it's all free services we put out so much for free we've got um when we went over to charging for some of our products we we thought really hard about it and we made sure that what we were charging was really um 
I guess, kind and fair, yeah. and not profit driven, because the, 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 the key motivator was always to still make that difference. And in selling those products over the years, since uh, we started that counseling tutor has grown as a result of that, it employs people who work within us, many of them counselors who write for us or do other work within within counseling tutor. And we've gone from uh, helping supporting and serving um, hundreds of people to 10s of 1000s of people yep. a year, you know, and it's not about profit. Our our values remain the same. If you're looking for our values, go to counselingtutor.com, click on the about us uh, uh, right at the top there and you'll see our values. We put them on our website and we will stick to those values and we, we, we weigh every decision we make uh, against those values. We are people over profit every single time mm. uh, without compromise ever because that's why we came into this in the first place. And if your mindset is pure, if you know why you are doing what you are doing, if you are in service, hey, it's all right to charge for it. Absolutely, Ken. And there may be someone listening, a listener listening, thinking, mm, I haven't got a business mindset. But I would ask you this question. You get your money, get paid. You pay your bills, you pay your council tax, you pay electricity, gas, water. That is effectively running your home business. If you've yeah. got, if you're organized to do that, either by, I mean, I do it but like a lot of people, I have standing order. <clears throat> you know, it's done for me through the bank. But if you're doing that, then you actually have, the very fact you've set it up is the fact that you have a skill set that links into building the business. The next step is to think about how you, you know, how you promote yourself, how much you charge, um, the the kind of mechanisms that you need to be a private practitioner, such as, you know, insurance and a, a, somewhere to practice from, um, or, or training if you're going to work online, you're going to offer yourself and those online. But you, you've already, most of the way there, it's amazing people say, I've not got a business mind. And I say, well, you're actually paying your bills and you're, you know, you're, you're keeping afloat. So you, you, you're you not as, as kind of... Uh, you don't have the lack of agency that you think you have. You know, you're already there, really. You just need to kind of step it up a bit. And I know lots of people who run <clears throat> really ethical counselling practices. Yeah. And one of the things that surprised me when I went into private practice, Ken, um, with the greatest, greatest respect to those people who, who may be listening, who may be my clients, was that the people who came to me were ordinary people. They didn't turn up in Ferraris or Porsches or helicopters. We didn't have a landing pad at my practice, I have to say. They turned up and they were ordinary people wanting help or extraordinary people wanting help. And they were happy to pay for that help. And they got the help they needed. You know, a lot said, uh, this was really helpful. I can make the changes in my life. I, I know where I need to go. So it, there is a, there is a, I don't know. There's a principal position, I think, for offering paid counselling and being a private practitioner, Ken. Yeah, well, this is what this new section is about, Practice Partner. We're going to be talking about many different elements of uh, starting and running a, a, a private practice. And the truth of the matter is, it is simpler than many think. Mm. You know, we can overcomplicate it, specifically going on Google, starting to look around about oh, how to start a business. You're going to be bombarded. You're going to be overwhelmed. Um, it's simpler than you think. As you've already touched on, Rory, it's the same as running a home. You basically yeah. got bills <laughs> that you need to pay uh, and, and money coming in. Uh, but we'll touch on more elements of that. We hope that it is a, a useful um, topic. If you are considering uh, starting a practice, a private practice follow along if you if you're running one uh, follow along and, and feedback on on the the facebook group go to counselingtutor.com uh, no don't go there well go there anyway but that's not where you're going to find us on facebook <laughs> <is it? laughs> no if you want to go on, if you want to go on to facebook um type in facebook ken yeah okay thank you <laughs> go to facebook go yeah to facebook type in counseling tutor and you'll find us we're a closed group but we're our moderators will let you in and you can join thousands of like-minded people. We've got supervisors. We've got qualified uh, colleagues. <clears throat> we've got students. Um, we have, you know, I'm sure we have members of the general public in. 
and start the conversation. And a lot of the conversations will be about starting the private practice or talking about theory or any aspects of counselling. And um, you come and come and join us and, and join the conversation. We'd love to see you there. Yeah, and if, if you're starting private practice, in private practice, share your challenges. Yeah, yeah. There's ideas for topics that, that we can pull out. I know there's many, many topics we've already pulled out. People asking, what's the? should I set up as a limited company? Should I do it as a sole trader? All this and more to come in the uh, practice partner section of the Counseling Tutor Podcast. Right. We've got to get to practice matters, Rory. Why? Because practice matters. It does matter. Practice matters is uh, the section where we look at something that is related to our practice. It may be a presentation of somebody coming in. It could be uh, something to do with the running of the practice, not the business side, but maybe note taking or GDPR compliance. But today it is an interview, Rory, and we love bringing on uh, experts in the field. You spoke with Christine Shaw about humor in therapy. Yes. Um a lot of people think that therapy is um, maybe doom and gloom. And indeed, we, we do work with some difficulty, sadness, pain in, in therapy. But there are times where there's levity and that people will, sh will share humorous um, experiences or metaphorically humorous experiences. So I was delighted to interview Christine Shaw, who's done a fantastic lecture on humor in therapy for both our counselor csr library and the cpd library and she talks about humor in therapy and what she hopes people will take away from her lecture and this is what she had to say and we welcome christine shaw who is a colleague of mine um, we both teach or have taught together on the um, supervision course that counseling tutor runs and you're here to really here today to talk about your lecture that you've made for the CSR Library and the Councillor CPD Library, an upcoming lecture, Humour in Therapy. So my first question is, Christine, is, is therapy a laughing matter? I think therapy is a fairly serious matter, isn't it? Um, but I think therapy is also about life and all it entails. And definitely humour is part of that. And occasionally laughter is part of humour. Uh, that's the kind of connection in a way. But, uh, you know, sometimes clients will say, um, you know, I really enjoyed that session. And then they say, is it okay to say enjoyed? Yes. So I, I think there are lots of emotions involved in therapy. And on occasion we can take ourselves too seriously ah i think that's i think that's uh, that's an interesting point because i was going to come to this um i think sometimes you know we sometimes think of our work in in a very somber through a very somber prism um but actually we're meeting the clients where they're at aren't we yeah and let's say you know we have clients of course we do in those really deep dark places and we're there with them there and we have clients who reach a different place, you know, and that's our aim to go with them along that journey. And when they get to a place where, you know, some joy starts to appear and some life starts to appear and it, it's the actualizing tendency, we'd say in person-centered work, we're there with them as well to celebrate, you know, those aspects of themselves. Yeah. Absolutely, Christine. And I think some people forget the, there is there is joy in therapy because you know people may have had a change of heart a change of mind they may realize that you know they aren't to blame for things and the relief is palpable and i guess with joy comes humor yeah and we've all you know had, I, I hope have those uh you know those clients who come along and you open the door or you sort of you sort of start to talk to them on the telephone or you they, they appear on your Zoom and you can see that something has lifted and it's that's when some of that kind of, um, you know, that, that joy that you called it of life or that sort of, a, you, you know, that glad to be alive starts to appear. You can almost visibly see it and hear it uh, in front of you. 
And why would we be serious about that? Serious in the, in the sense, the way we talk, the way we communicate. There are all sorts of different ways of, you know, forming bonds and being with our clients. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, think you, I think you make a really good point. Um, especially around the actualizing tendency, you know, you know, as I say, with joy comes humor and it's, it's very, very, it's, 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 I've seen it in my therapy room a lot where people have been so happy and you share that happiness with the client. Do you think there's a space for laughing at ourselves in therapy? Absolutely. You know, uh, I think we can tend to begin to think, are we, that we're very important and uh, I think we're all of great value and we're of great value together. But, you know, a therapist can begin to think that there's some kind of vital cog in the workings of things. And we need to get a perspective on ourselves. And I think, you, you know, it is two people meeting together is where the <coughs> therapy works, is where change takes place. It could well be another therapist doing that. And uh, then we worry, you know, about maybe something we said or, or you know, should I have said that? And, um, you know, is the client really worrying about that? I think we can begin to take ourselves very, very seriously and, and forget the basics that we're sitting with another human being and as helpfully as we can. Yes. I mean, I, I, I think what you're, what, you're, what you're speaking to is congruence being real and genuine in the therapy room. And I know there's been times, I mentioned this in the podcast before, um, I can remember doing a summary uh, with a young client many, many years ago as a school counsellor. And as I, as I was going through it, I'm thinking to myself, this is awful. <laughs> this is the <laughs> worst summary I've ever done. And I got to the end of it and I said, I just think that was probably not a great summary. And she, she kind of laughed at me and she said, no, it was really, Really bad. Uh, it was terrible. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> yes, and um, and I just had one of those off days that I guess therapists have. And um, when she came in again, she said, uh, "Have you improved your summaries, Rory?" And we had such a good laugh about that. <laughs> yeah. And I think it improved the therapeutic relationship. She saw me as a, a human being. And it's something that you and that client share. No one else is knowing about your terrible summaries, necessarily, but you and her have that kind of bond now. It's a kind of something you refer back to. Uh, you know, you can, in a, in a, some of these kind of things can almost become a theme, you know, throughout, and it it's, creates memories in a way. You know, it, it sort of creates a kind of, oh, can you remember when? moments you know in a in a small way but it, it starts to bond you with that person and it shows your client doesn't it that you're a, a real person too you're not this expert who's you know sort of seriously telling them you know this is what I, I find you're kind of saying I'm here with you too you know and I think any moments like that you you kind of remember I, I think do you know I think you're right I think I think you're right if I think of therapy I've had Mm. Um, the moments I tend to remember are those are those ones of connection and and humor plays a big surprisingly enough humor plays a big part in my life. Um, I, I can always see the funny side of things, which which then brings me to the point of how do we become self aware around humor? You know, I don't think any client wants a stand up comedian as a therapist. <laughs> And, you know, I can't tell a joke. You know, I just can't do it. I forget them. I can't do it. Um, and so I think there are so many different types of humour, aren't they? And, it, and if it's not part of who you are, okay, it's not part of who you are, and that's all right. But it, if, if it is part of a big part of how you communicate, and I think it would be silly to stifle it, you know, if you have you know just the right thing to say at just the right time it's like any other intervention isn't it in counseling why would you keep it in why why wouldn't you use it but i think it's being very aware though of why you're using it that you know you're not just trying to look clever or kind of uh, get something in you know it's arises naturally and it arises from what the client is giving you um yeah yeah, so I, I, yeah, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's external, isn't it? 
So, you know, we're, we're reacting as, as therapists, we, we react and we work with what the client brings. And if there's a theme of somberness, then we may work with that. But if there's a, a, a you know, a, a theme of joy mm. and, and it really just comes back, doesn't it? To being, to being who you are I, as a supervisor, um, do you do you encourage your supervisees to kind of explore the humorous side of them, if appropriate? Um, I think you know I wait until really a supervisee may bring humour, and you know maybe be telling me something that happened in a session, and something they said, and off sometimes they don't realise it is humour. You know they, they've picked up on a theme really. Um, I, I remember um, a supervisor telling me how their client had a lot of anxiety and had real problems, you know, um, ordering a sandwich in one of those places where they go through, do you want this on, do you want that on, do you want the other on? And they just sort of said, I want a ham sandwich, you know, and they remembered that. They kind of brought it into the session later, you know, and, and they kind of, uh, and I could see the humour then. I had to tell them, that's a really good use of therapeutic humour and they didn't know mm. and other times people will you know supervisees will say oh i um i said this thing and um you know and we laughed and i'm not sure if that's okay oh. and that's when we start to look at it you know was it okay or wasn't it okay and and it's i think the clue is in the word we oh. we laughed yes uh you know we're we're sharing it. We're doing something together here. We're in the same place at the same time. And clients, you know, can, um, you know, I've heard supervisors, you know, telling me about clients who are hysterical with laughter at some things when a perspective suddenly changes and it gets rid of a load of weight. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I think you're right. I think that picking up on that should i should i have laughed at that should i have done that i think certainly for trainee colleagues there's a sense that sometimes that gets projected in training that we're in a serious profession it's a professional profession that we're you know working with the client and sometimes that side of us that humorous side of us gets gets lost but what i'm hearing you saying as long as it's the humor is part of a co-created relationship <laughs> Then you 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 you're almost always going to be on the right side of it. It's it's part of developing the relationship. It's to be treated with care, and I, I say a lot of how I, I think in my lecture. And you know, I as a student, I kind of you know came across laughter and humour in in my sessions and the recordings we had to do. And I remember feeling a bit kind of, you know, is this okay or not? And I was met with a bit of a you know, it didn't look as though it was quite okay. But um, I stuck with it. <laughs> yeah. I don't go into a session, as I say, like thinking it's going to be funny or anything. But if it arises, I work with it. I work with what's given. And I would encourage, you know, supervisors to work with what comes um, helpfully, appropriately. Well, I mean, I think that on that note... We'll, we'll come to the end of our interview because I think it's absolutely about um, working with working appropriately, like in every aspect of our practices, it's being you know appropriate and I think probably measured. One final question. What do you hope that people will get from your lecture? What do you hope that those who watch it may take away? Yeah, I hope people will, you know, no longer be, you know, thinking that humour has to be something in hiding or something not to be talked about, that they'll, they'll see the relevance and appropriateness and helpfulness of the good use of humour in therapy and have the confidence, I think, to be, you know, be congruent and all, use all parts of themselves, you know, not to be a diluted version of, of yourself, to bring those parts out uh, in service of the client. Well, thank you, Christine. Christine Shaw's lecture, Humour in Counselling, is going to be available in the Counselor CSR and CPD libraries. It isn't one to be missed, an essential component, I think, of any therapeutic um, awareness. 
And Christine Shaw, thank you so much for joining us today. Big thank you to Christine Shaw. Big thank you to you, Rory, for for hosting that that interview. Um, If you want to listen to Christine's lecture on humour in therapy, if you're a qualified practitioner, we have a library. It's a CPD library, a continuing professional development library. You can find more about that at counsellingtutor.com. If you're a student and you want to dip your toe into humor in therapy, Christine agreed to share the lecture in our counseling study resource. That's a, a resource library for, for students, and you can find more about that by also going to counselingtutor.com. And Rory, this has been episode 234 of the Counseling Tutor podcast. Yeah, it's really delightful to be back after the academic break with a brand new f- format. We started with theory and practice, where we spoke about how the core conditions can be used in real life situations with real life people. We moved on to practice partner again, another new section in our podcast where we talk about business, business mindset and exploring what you need to think about if you're going to sell, set yourself up as a self-employed counselor. And finally, practice matters. We interview Christine Shaw who talks about humor in therapy it's uh, it's been a full bundle of information and as always stay grounded and stay safe